welcome to another Rowing Chat. I'm Rebecca Caro, and you can listen to Rowing Chat either on our RSS feed, which you will find at our website, rowing.chat, where we also have the archive of all the past episodes. Rowing Chat is a network of podcasts and includes a range of different shows. You can also follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. Uh, You just look for Rowing Chat, you'll find us. Now, today I have a very special guest, Patrick Fricky from The Crew Stop. Patrick, welcome to Rowing Chat. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, let's kick off with you telling the listeners a little bit about yourself and uh, your background in the weird sport of rowing. In the weird sport of rowing, yeah. So um, uh, I was probably uh, 13 or 14 years old, and my parents enrolled me in a, um, a summer rowing camp. Um, obviously, I knew nothing about rowing, and um, by the end of the summer, I was uh, stroking the boat for the eight um, that I was in. Um, I, I was, I'm, I'm guessing in, in retrospect that I may have been put in stroke because I was um, uh, fairly steady with my, uh, my stroke rate because I was also at the same time taking cello lessons. Um, so I, I was very uh, rhythmic in my, uh, uh, my stroke pattern. At least that's what I'm, I'm surmising. Um, and then I left the sport, um, went into gymnastics and, um, um, track and pole vaulting and skydiving and everything in between. And, um, it was only when I was, um, returning, uh, home here in, in, um, upstate New York, um, in a visit that happened to coincide with a local regatta. And I was there with some friends, uh, watching the regatta. And I just, uh, commented, you know, I used to, I used to row and, um, and that was really the beginning, uh, the second beginning. So as an adult, uh, I ended up joining a local uh, rowing club and started competing and, um, got more and more interested in it. And um, I always, um, because this was now master's rowing, uh, thought it was kind of strange that, you know, as master's rowers, people don't row eight hours a day, uh, four or five days a week. So uh, they go through these cycles where their hands are soft and then their hands are are uh, blistered and bloody and then they're uh calloused and then they're soft again and you know it's they're gloves for every other sport in the uh, in the world and i remember in my gymnastics days you know i had gloves for the high bar um and you know you have gloves for baseball you have gloves for football receivers um anything golf uh, has gloves Uh, anywhere the hand is involved in gripping something there is a glove and why isn't there a glove in the sport of rowing it never made sense to me and my background is in design. So I just became curious about it enough to uh, want to poke at that a little bit. Um, and then I started coaching and, and in um, both masters and, and more importantly, youth um, rowers and the same thing was occurring there. Um, so um, we went through a series of, uh, uh, design development, and as I look back on some of the designs as they started out, they're they're pretty uh, pretty hilarious. <laughs> but um, we eventually whittled it down to something that was um, very minimal. Um, I, I I saw a lot of taping, um, a lot of techniques for taping, and that was the solution. If you had a blister, you would tape it, and um, and then you left the um, the ore handle with the adhesive residue, and uh, if you didn't tape, and a lot of coaches even today, um, you know, frown on uh, on wearing gloves. They're just it's it's just the name glove. It's that term that I think um, brings the antibodies out in all the coaches that you know say you can't do that because before uh, the um, uh, development of, of our rowing glove, um, what did people use, especially masters rowers, you know, gardening gloves, um, work gloves, uh, anything to protect their hands. And, and of course, 
those weren't designed for the articulation of of the uh, the oar handle and and you know your um, your hands, uh, especially in sweep rowing with a drive hand and a, a feathering hand, they weren't designed to um, uh, accommodate those kinds of movements. So naturally, coaches are going to frown on anything uh, that would impede that kind of thing. So for that perspective, I understand it. Um, but uh, even today, we I have uh, an email from a a parent of a college student. Um, I'm, I'm thinking it might be from Princeton, but uh, she was uh, writing back to return the gloves that she purchased for her daughter because the coach doesn't allow it for practice or regattas. Even though it's perfectly legal everywhere, there's nothing that says you can't wear a rowing glove, but it's that kind of thing. And, and even when um, you, we were talking previously about the head of the Charles, um, we were um, uh, very new, and so we were a vendor at, at the head of the Charles. And there, there were two things that I thought uh, were pretty funny. Uh, one was um, uh, young kids that would come up and say, I wish I could wear gloves, but my coach won't let me. And so we'd give them a pair of gloves and go show them to your coach. And, and most of the time, the coach would say, OK, because now they're seeing them, and they're seeing them and how thin they are, how minimal. Um, and so they're okay. But then at the other side where the, um, the master's rowers would come up and look at our booth and the rowing gloves. And remember, this is Boston. This is like the Mecca for, um, for rowing and the head of the Charles. And they would, they would look at us and they would say, well, rowing gloves, we don't wear them here. <laughs> and, and yet we have, um, quite a large, uh, customer base in the, the Boston area. So those were the early days, and you know the stigma still applies today. There's a lot of coaches that, that won't allow them their their rowers to wear gloves, and and you know so I think that it may take a, a a generation to become educated that you can design a covering for your hand to allow the development of calluses um, without the um, the period of, of blister formation. You just let the skin get hard and. Um, it's uh, it doesn't impede the uh, the performance of the um, the rowers um, uh, stroke cycle at all. So um, we've been tremendously successful um, since we um, uh, first started selling them. I think it's probably back in 2013, um, and we're just uh, signing on a new distributor in in um, Hong Kong. Um, because there's a very strong, um, very um, enthusiastic rowing base uh, growing in China. Great. So I'm going to roll you back somewhat, Patrick. Um, sure. You said that you have a background in design. What sort of design did you work with? Uh, I was a design manager in a uh, 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 in the photographic industry and and. Um, um, developing products. So I was uh, within a design group that included industrial designers, uh, human factors, engineers. Um, my group was um, um, graphic and uh, user interface designers, um, any um, interfaces, uh, digital displays, and, and um, uh, the like that uh, were incorporated into products. So uh, I worked very closely with both industrial designers and human factors people. So that really sort of um, elevated my sensitivity to um, human perf uh, um, computer performance in, um, in in that context, uh, and that that design sensitivity um, carried over into uh, my curiosity in in the the sport of rowing and um, what I was experiencing personally and what I was seeing around me. So um, that's how that came about. So. Roll us right back to the very early days. You had this little thought that said, maybe I could design a glove for rowing. Yeah. How does a designer actually go about the process of designing something? So talk sure. us through the theory, and then we'll go back and talk about the practice. Yeah. Um, well, we started developing concepts um, um, just uh, on the computer and uh, looking at materials. So just roll right back to the, sure. the principles. Okay. How do you go about making yeah. a design? The only way I can answer that is 
just putting pen to paper uh, wow. sketches. Okay. So if so I can show you. hand holding an oar. A curl, yeah, curl and finger. Yep, yeah, mm -hmm. how they articulate, um, looking at materials and how materials can conform to those um, those shapes and um, and then just looking at the uh, the end result and seeing uh, if it can work or not. So you, some of the concepts were really based on uh, what I knew about uh, the hand covering for a, a gymnast. And oh, okay, so what how was that? They just, they just went over two fingers and you just had a pad and then you have a big wrist closure. And and then so that um, was a palm and yeah. two fingers, you said. Yeah. Two middle fingers and, and yeah. then a closure on the wrist. And that's because you were hanging from high bar and hoops right. as a gymnast. Yeah. So what was the purpose of that glove? It just had to grip? No, it really didn't have to grip. It was really uh, protecting you from your your own skin rolling over on itself as as uh, you're rotating around a high bar. Um, so it was a gliding yeah. rotation. So it was yeah. a smooth, frictionless sort of glove. Yeah. They were made of leather. Um, okay. And... Um, that was a very purposeful glove just for one activity. Um, so roll us back onto the rowing challenge. Sure. So the rowing challenge uh, was uh, for me is that I, I didn't have any real sense of material. Um, the the first thing uh, you know one would think of would be leather because so many gloves uh, and, and hand coverings are are made from leather. Um, and actually, our, our first uh, material um, prototype. Once we went through the um, the design cycle, and um, if I had done my homework, I, I should have printed out or, or so, so you can show uh, some of the designs um, that um, or the the concepts that we um, we put forth and evaluated. Um, because I I look back as I mentioned that you know that I think they're pretty funny for how cumbersome they look um, by comparison to what we ended up with, um, but we uh, we had a, a synthetic uh, leather like material that had a lot of um, um, adhesion to it, um, but the problem with with that and we thought that we were pretty close to um, a production. Um, material, um, but in in testing, going out and, and rowing over time, we found that that leather stretched, and the more it stretched, the more it became um, an issue within the palm, where the material would start to just roll on itself, and and um, that in itself can produce a blister. So it uh, would bunch up. Bunching up. Yep. Okay. So. Yeah. This was a synthetic leather. Um, yeah. I know a little bit about clothes fabrics because they're usually woven, you know, with right. a warp and a weft, uh, yeah. and you can cut them on the diagonal to prevent that sort of thing. Right. Is there something you can do like that with with synthetic leathers? Uh, there was no um, there was no uh, woven pattern per se in in this material. Uh -huh. um, not in the way that, that you describe. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I probably have a, a pair somewhere. Um, but um, we had other alternatives. So it wasn't that we really felt that we needed to really, you know, see if we could manage that and, and maybe uh, die cut it at a different angle so that we could minimize or eliminate um, that. We just moved on to a different material that we found that was much more suitable um, for this um, particular purpose. And we ended up using what we have now, uh, which so is- tell me, When you're looking at the fabrics, what are the different elements? Presumably there's, there's thickness. Yes. Yeah. What are the other constituent parts that, that you review when you're designing? Oh well, the other one was uh, was elasticity. So that was the big thing is to see, you know, if we could uh, have something that had the the kind of um, 
um, resistance to what we saw in that that first um, leather material um, that it would maintain its its shape. And the material that we use right now um, has, uh, I mean, it's interesting from the standpoint that longitudinally. So if I if I have my my hand here, so longitudinally up and down, there is um, no elasticity, but from laterally side to side, there is a little bit of elasticity. So you can stretch this around um, your hand and have it fit well, but in that actuation of, of rowing, you're, you're not going to uh, stretch the material from uh, wrist to fingertip. That's really yeah. smart. So you so length and width, different properties. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. that's the that's the palm of your hand sorted. Yeah. What about the back of your hand? Yeah. So the, I mean, the other thing is, and this is in recognition of of the uh, the uh, perceptions and the stigma that we uh, knew we were going to be dealing with. So we wanted something that was. Uh, very unobtrusive. And if you look at the white elastic uh, bands on the back of the hand, um, at first glance from the shore, if you're watching a rower and you're seeing that, you may just think that it's somebody that's taped their fingers, which is, you know, quite <laughs> the accepted norm. So that was um, very purposeful for what we had, had, had done. And, and the rest was just an, wanting an open hand um, that... Um, uh, contributed to the the minimalist um, kind of approach that we were really um, moving toward. So um, those two things let us, um, you know, made us feel pretty comfortable that, you know, somebody wasn't going to feel very conspicuous um, out in the boat uh, with a big colorful glove on that, um, you know, would command... Uh, attention or make them feel self-conscious or, or whatnot so uh so that was our psychology with <laughs> with the uh the white elastic in the background or in the, the back of the fingers that's great yeah. and of course it has the velcro closure around the back of your wrist and it has now, the velcro closure yeah now obviously some rowers sweep and and some skull and, and some do both and in right. theory at least in sweep Inside and outside hands have different jobs. Right. So yeah. How did you approach this design challenge? Well, uh, so we we sell gloves either by the pair or um, or uh, uh, as a single glove or as a combination. Um, we we sell the um, uh, the sculling what we call the sculling glove, and this is my well worn sculling glove uh, with uh, a silicone uh, pad print. Um, on the palm and on the fingers. Um, so this would be your feathering hand. So if you're a sweep rower, you would use this on your feathering hand. And we also sell a glove that we call the sweep glove, which only has the silicone on the, the fingertips. It doesn't have the silicone on the bulk of the hand. So that allows the oar handle to rotate freely through your uh, your hand as your feathering hand is, is uh, rotating that oar handle. Um, so a lot of customers uh, order uh, port pair or a starboard pair, um, but I have to say we sell uh, mostly sculling gloves, and um, I'm pretty sure that um, they're not all scullers. That we have a lot of rowers who are um, rowing sweep, but row with uh, sculling gloves, which is fine because you can, if you're mindful just to loosen that hand, that's the drive hand, as you're rotating through it, and that will also allow, and it's actually probably for learning, uh, it would be a, um, a good thing because for those that are just beginning to row, one of the things that is pretty common from a coaching perspective and, and observation is is seeing that they're, they're feathering and squaring their, uh, their oar with both hands. Yeah. And and um, when I'm teaching people to skull, they do exactly the same. They don't feather into the fingers. They use the wrists right. and yeah. obviously yeah. both hands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. Go. Uh, oh, just uh, in in further development. So we've been uh, 
doing a lot of tweaking with this glove and in the um, uh, the elastic in the back and and particularly the velcro initially the velcro started to wear uh, more frequently or more um, uh, earlier than we really anticipated for real active rowers to the point where it wasn't really uh, as functional as it uh, was meant to be so then you know we we changed um, our Velcro to what is now is is just a super aggressive Velcro, <laughs> and uh, I'm hoping that will relax a little bit because they are tough uh, to remove. But um, at the same time, we do have customers that that write us back and say that they drove home with their gloves on because they forgot that they had them on. That they you know just, just they just don't feel like you're wearing something. But as far as the material goes, um, we're also looking at a, um, a new technology uh, with um, nanofibers, um, polyester nanofibers that uh, basically have their own uh, built-in uh, grip factor, which would negate the need for the um, silicone printing on the, on the, the palm of the, the hand. Um, so I have a, a, a prototype I've already had made, uh, with that material. Um, <clears throat> we were just, uh, it's kind of the end of our rowing season in, in upstate New York, uh, here. Um, but, uh, as we move indoors to, um, um, indoor rowing tanks, um, we want to be able to test that out as, um, a possible, um, um, replacement for uh, this material, this Axwade material that we're currently uh, producing. What are nanofibers? You're going to have I to... I have no idea. <laughs> you know, I'm, they're very small fibers. <laughs> <laughs> it's just new technology. And, and um, I, I, uh, my manufacturing partner um, was at a, uh, uh, a convention uh, and as a sporting convention, fabrics were a, a big part of that. And um, I told them the things that we were interested in because, you know, even, I mean, the glove I have on, I've been wearing for about three years. And, you know, some of the silicone is beginning to to peel off a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's worn. And, you know, gloves aren't going to last forever. No matter what sport you're in, you're going to be buying replacements uh, at some point. Um, as you continue whatever sport you're in that, that uses a glove. Mm. Um, but um, I think that there's, um, you know, there's, uh, I'm just assuming that there's opportunities out there for material advancement. So um, uh, Heather might be- You certainly see it. You certainly see it in, in other forms of athletic clothing. Oh, sure. You know? oh, yeah. and, and that's, um, so we're looking at that. So that's uh um, pretty interesting for us. We got a, we have a write up on the, the technology and, and we had a sample made and it is, it is nice and, and grippy, but it's also the other nice thing about it is that the materials is very thin. So I think it's very conducive to, uh, producing, um, into a, uh, uh, another rowing glove. And it's so still a term that I, I can't, um, uh, the word glove is still something that I struggle with because I, I hate calling them gloves, but I, I haven't come up with anything else um, that would be um, uh, a, a good replacement. But as far I as... Have one for you. Pardon me? I have a replacement for you. I think okay. you just call it rower's hands. Rower's hands. Yeah, rower's hands. Yeah, good. Hand coverings is a bit clumsy. I'm, it yeah, is. Hey, yeah. My, yeah. my free branding advice 101. <laughs> Do I have to pay you a percentage of every sale if I start uh, using it? I, no, just keep me continually supplied with gloves, Patrick. We'll, we'll All right, <laughs> fair enough. Um, but on the material front, um, uh, you know, we sell, most of what we sell are rowing gloves. Um, I manufactured a, and produced a, a tool, um, aluminum, um, that was, um, uh, powder coated for reaching down into the footwell for those boats that had wing nuts and the awkward uh, position of those wing nuts. So we did make a tool uh, and we sold out of those and, and I lost money on every one. 
Um, but most of what we sell are, are rowing gloves. We have some apparel, but I'm interested in um, in technical apparel as well. And uh, I'm particularly interested in a fabric that was developed by NASA. Um, I'm not sure when. But the interesting property of, of this material, and there are only certain mills that are certified to produce this material. Um, the interesting property to me is, let's say you have um, a rower, like the head of the Charles coming up in October. Um, the weather can be pretty chilly, but you have to row 5,000 meters up to the start um, and then race back. So. Uh, the property of this material that I find really intriguing is that as your body heats up, it takes that body heat and absorbs it into the material and stores it. And then as you cool down, it releases that, that heat back to you. And I think that's a really great material for a, um, um, a shirt or a long sleeve, short sleeve uh, for... Um, the sport of rowing because we go through those uh, periods where you start out and you're, you're cold and, and you row and warm up and then you have to wait for the start and then you may cool down again and then you race back to the finish line. So um, we're in the very early stages of that. Um, I don't have any samples made. Um, it's logistically just a, a little bit more of a... Um, process than um, having a glove made by the manufacturer who's already making your gloves. So, <laughs> but I, I think that's, uh, you know, in, in terms of um, what else we may want to get into, I, I want to, I'd like to um, offer something that I'm not seeing um, in the sport. Uh, there's lots of spandex in the sport um, and um, general apparel, but uh, you know, there are lots of, I don't necessarily want to compete with what's already out there. Um, I'd like to offer something that, um, that, uh, would be new to the sport in terms of a, the technical, uh, functionality of it. So. That's really admirable, but we have skipped over your most recent product, which is already released and made yeah. and on the market. Show me yeah. your left hand. Yeah. Yeah. So here's my left hand. Um, so this is a, we, we were looking at a, a paddle glove, um, it, both for rowers where the, um, the, um, interest was having, uh, coverage for all five fingers because we get customers that say, well, um, why don't you cover the little finger? Because I, I get blisters on my little finger. And there was a reason why we didn't cover the little finger um, in the design. I don't really, uh, I haven't really explained that, but we didn't want to um, encourage um, the the use of that finger necessarily for um, for gripping because once you start to um, use the muscles in the little finger, you're squeezing. Um, the ore more tightly than you really need to. So in, um, in, a, in a way of, of coaxing rowers to uh, just keep that finger relaxed and, and just uh, use the others, we, um, we left that open. Um, but we do have rowers that, that have uh, written back to us um, enough so that we started to explore it. But then we were thinking, well, um, there are a lot of other sports, um, water sports, where um, we're not seeing these. And, and uh, we have um, some people in our, our boat club that uh, also have uh, racing kayaks. Um, and they, they're, um, they're a little different. And uh, one of the, the things that, you know, the racing kayak, you pick up by yourself. Um, much as you would a single, but rather than you, you don't pick up, um, you pick up a single with the, on one hand on either side of the gunnel and that's fine. Um, when I'm watching the, the racing kayaks, they, they pick up their, uh, their kayak, uh, with one hand on the inside of, of the boat, which is molded differently than 
what we're used to in, in um, sculling boats and they can be slippery. Um, so we started developing one that has uh, all five fingers. Um, the length of it is, is uh, in the fingers is a little bit longer. Um, the overall fit is uh, pretty similar. We've relaxed it by about a millimeter. Um, you can see the, the silicone pattern is the same. Um, otherwise, the, the design is very similar. Um, the elastic in the back is, is, um, is a little different. It's more of a, a foamy material. Um, mm -hmm. But we just put these out on the market this summer. And um, they're selling quite well. Um, we haven't really advertised very much. We're just putting an ad together. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's um, for those that uh, also row in a skull in, in boats like dories or um, um, canoes and kayaks um, and other applications that are yeah. uh, similar. Um, uh, paddle boards and I think uh, boards, water, um, yeah. Yeah, dragon boats and right. we have oh, exactly. yeah. 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 The, the, the paddle boards, the racing for paddle boards, long distance races are, are insane. Um, and, and I've done the paddle boarding and, you know, it's, it does. It goes right into your palm. Um, I don't know how they do it, but uh, so this is uh, this is going to be our is a new offering, and um, we're pretty excited about it. It's doing pretty well, um, and it's interesting that uh, people, even from from other sports, uh, we have an immersion diver uh, who wears them as she pulls herself down um, the line. On the right. Yeah, 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 just the free diving. Uh, yeah, yeah, she's yeah. she goes. I don't know how many feet, two hundred feet or something like that. Ooh. It's that crazy, and, folks. Yeah, and so she wears our gloves, and and of course we have some Olympians that wear our gloves as well for um, uh, practicing. So when they're in training, um, they wear our gloves as well. Um, so it's um, you know, it just speaks to the um, uh, the variety of of um, perceptions and, and takes on that. You know, there's uh, one Olympian likes to wear them because um, the, she finds it very helpful in the, um, in the sweaty months and, and when it's really hot out and um, it provides grip. And the other thing about the um, this um, nano fiber material that we like is that the wetter the glove becomes, the more grippy it becomes. Huh. Which is um, a pretty kind of unique property. Um, so, Go on. Yeah, new Can glove. Can you name the Olympian, Patrick? Are you allowed to tell us who she is? Uh, Karen Davies um, is uh, is the one that wears them uh, right now. Um, uh, and there are a couple that have worn them for uh, for training in the past. But I'm not sure they're still active. Um, Karen's been um, Wonderful. She's um, offered to provide us uh, some support in in um, gaining access to that elite um, section of the sport um, for training. We we did send uh, we we had um, Kevin Sauer from the, the head of the head coach of the women's team at the University of Virginia, a very successful team. Uh, he has a bunch of our gloves that he gives out to rowers um it's as we like to promote it's a tool so you know if he sees a condition where one of his rowers is um from coming back from um a summer of of no rowing where the hands are soft um you know it's it's another tool it gives them a pair of gloves to wear while the hands start to um, to harden up mm -hmm. so it's, it's just like you know it's like wearing sunglasses you wear them when you need them you don't wear them when you don't you wear and your gloves so, when you need them. We don't promote that you always have to wear gloves. It's much better. And, you know, it's just like everything else. You have a hat in the sun, you wear it. And, you know, other times you don't. Um, so, yeah. I have a feeling that I saw photos of Karen Davies at the World Championships racing wearing your gloves. I definitely, oh, okay. oh. someone in her crew, yeah. I think it was. And, and, and she's been a guest here on, on Rowing Chat. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, go look out those photos. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, we yeah. So I, I was coaching when I was when I, I coached uh, youth and um, 
masters and one of the rowers um, that I've continued to follow uh, after high school uh, was uh, a young girl who um, was really excelling um, in the sport and sculling. And I coached her for a couple of years and now she's on the, the national team um, in a double, uh, lightweight double. Uh, so she's doing well and, and she also uh, uses the gloves for training. She doesn't wear them racing, but she uses the gloves for training. And, you know, I think that's um, really just exactly how we intend it. Um, so. That's great. And what's her name? Uh, Olivia Farrar, F-A-R-R-A-R. -R -R. We'll go look at Olivia up as well. That's yeah. cool. Now, tell us, I think I'm right that these gloves go in the washing machine. They do. Yep. You can throw them in the washing machine. Uh, we um, don't really encourage you to throw them in the dryer as well. Um, you can hang dry them uh, after um, they get out of the wash, and, and that's fine. You can put them in a, a wash basin and just let them soak because uh, uh, anyone who's worn them, you know, they like anything you, you wear when your body's attached to it, they, they can smell. <laughs> so they get a good aroma. <laughs> But they wash up. Oh yeah. Obviously. And then also, I'd love to know a little bit more about how you selected your manufacturer because I think, am I right? You manufacture in the United States. No, we don't. So uh, our our manufacturing partner um, is in the United States. They're in in Connecticut, um, mm -hmm. and. They have um, f factory relations all over the world, uh, depending on what the application is. Um, uh -huh. For us, they were top tier. Um, they are the manufacturer for gloves for Nike. Um, they uh, manufacture gloves for... Um, every major brand that you can think of um, outdoors marmot um, is a well-known company they make gloves uh, for them and we um, struck up a, a very good relationship and they looked at the design that we were um, honing in on and they chose a factory that they thought would um, do the best job in producing that particular glove and the, the technical requirements uh, in, involved in, in making that glove. Um, yeah. But um, so we had a great relationship for uh, a number of years and um, they were uh, bought out by uh, another glove company uh, in New York City and they looked at us and said we were too small for them. So we were um, we were were kicked out um, and had to go elsewhere, and so that was a scramble for us. But we did find uh, uh, another a company. It was a it was a U.S. company, and they had a U.S. owned factory overseas, um, and that was um, that was working well. It was pretty seamless, um, but it was a it was a a constant effort um, to maintain. I had to spend a lot more uh, time um, dealing with um, production uh, to make sure that the um, the quality was um, uh, always at the the right level. Um, and it just came to the point where uh, we were at this crossroads where our our um, sales had been increased over the years because every year we we uh, have been selling more and more um, that we ultimately reached that minimum threshold for the company that that uh, gave us the boot. Um, so I, I I wrote to them and and I told them I said you know we can we can meet your minimum quantity requirements now. So can we come back please? <laughs> <laughs> so um, so we did. So we went through uh, all of the. Um, uh, accreditation. Um, it was pretty formal with this this new uh, organization um, that um, we had to go through um, a, a lot of um, you know financial uh, certification and 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 the like. And um, 
so we're we're back with them and couldn't be more happy. Um, it's a new factory and um, uh, everything seems to be working well for us uh, with this new relationship again or um, reinvigorated relationship. So yeah, fantastic circularity to business, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about relationships. Yeah. Now, Patrick, um, talk to us a little bit about your sizes and how people should measure their hands for, yeah. for buying a glove. So I've, I've put the um, website address on the screen, which is thecruestop.com. Mm -hmm. How do I choose the right pair for me? There is a video um, on the website in the shop page um, that goes through the, the process for uh, getting your size measured. So you take a, a cloth tape measure and you want your hand nice and wide, your fingers spread open, and you take your, your measurements around the widest part of your, your palm. And that dimension should correspond with um, one of the, uh, the sizes um, between uh, extra, extra small and extra, extra large. And if there's an overlap, if you're at the upper end of one size and the lower end of the next size, uh, we, I think we suggest going up to the, the larger size. Mm -hmm. And that measurement's in centimeters. And that measurement's in centimeters, yeah, yeah. Important point there, those of us who were brought up with Imperial. <laughs> Yes, yes, I know. I, I, I uh, maybe it's because we had a seamstress tape that we went immediately to centimeters. I mean, we might have to. We have a lot of sales in the U.S., obviously, but we may have to get something in inches, make it more straightforward for folks. I don't know. I haven't no, heard. No, no, inches, inches to die. <laughs> it's one of my life's missions. <laughs> right. Base ten is a much more logical oh, reason yeah. for yeah. choosing right. a system. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Patrick, talk us through your international distributors, because you mentioned earlier that uh, you have people around the world who will be yeah. local to our listeners. So where can they yeah. buy them? Um, so on the uh, shop page uh, um, or on the website, there's also a, a, a distributors page and um, rowers can look to see where uh, they might be um, closest to. Um, we have, um, row perfect in the, in the UK, of course, you know that, um, mm -hmm. we have distributors in the Netherlands, uh, Germany, Switzerland, uh, France, um, Eastern Europe. We have one in, uh, distributor in Slovakia. Um, as I mentioned, we just signed on to, um, uh, just in the process, um, of signing on a, a new distributor in Hong Kong. Um, Vespoli is a, um, a, a, a boat manufacturer here in the U.S. Um, they are also a, um, a distributor for us. And, um, and then Australia. So we have, I think we have two gaps, um, Africa and uh, South America, where we don't really have uh, much representation. Great. Well, if you're listening and you want to um, get in touch, Get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with Patrick and in all likelihood, he'll find a, a reason to chat. Yeah, I love to get uh, uh, feedback from uh, and letters from uh, from rowers. Um, we get into some interesting dialogues and, and sort of online coaching uh, once in a while when they can't figure out why they get a blister in this one little spot or, you know, what they're doing wrong. So um, I, I love to... to uh, trade emails with uh, with people. Tell us some of those stories. So what's the quirkiest place someone gets a blister and your solution? Um, quirkiest place. Um, I don't know if there's a quirky place, but uh, a, a common spot for the blister is right in the center of the palm. Um, I, I, you know, it's just when you start to, to dig into it, um, where you start to understand that a rower might be over gripping or um, maybe the glove is not the right uh, fit if, if, if they're still getting a blister uh, 
underglow, which is not really very common at all, but um, the the pinky finger is um, one area where um, uh, people and and they admit that you know I'm sorry I can't uh, I I have I know two rowers that that skull together as a team um, masters rowers in um, in Connecticut and uh, one of them I mean they've been rowing for twenty or thirty years and and she knows that she grips the oar handle too hard wow. and and she just can't help herself. She's just uh, she just chokes the handle. Um, so there are consequences for some uh, stuff like that. But um, I don't know if there is a, a one quirky uh, thing necessarily. Uh, I think it's more that um, we get some emails from customers and say, "Well, I I, I bought these gloves and um, I've worn them for only a few months, and um, I put a hole in the." I, I guess that would be the quirky one for me is um, I had a guy in Germany that um, uh, had the gloves for a very short time and, and he was rowing on a, on a rowing machine and, and put a hole in the glove. Hmm. And uh, I, 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 I thought that was remarkable. I said, that's almost impossible. So I, I sent him another pair and he put a hole in those gloves too. And he was just such a, um, an animal on the, on the rowing machine that he, he was, uh, uh, and there's no, there's not even any rotation, you know, the, the handle is you grip the handle and, and that's it. So, um, we never really uncovered, uh, what was going on. Um, he seemed to be content with the third pair, uh, you know, and some little coaching uh, on the side that, you know, to to be mindful of what he's doing and how he's gripping, where he's gripping. Um, and then we didn't uh, we didn't see that return uh, again. But uh, we don't often see uh, people wearing holes uh, through the gloves. Um, other things happen. You know, elastic will will give out or the Velcro on the back will start to degrade or the silicone will start to peel and they're left with um, the rest of the glove, but uh, holes is um, is probably one of the most uh, unusual um, consequences of uh, someone's rowing style that we've seen. Certainly, I see some quirky stuff happening on ergs in my gym. People do weird stuff at the finish, sticking their elbows out or oh, pulling yeah. the handle pulling up, up to their chin and then twisting their, their, their hand. hand. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some of it is. Uh, we have rowing tanks um, that uh, teams go into in the in the winter time. So there's there's four rowing tanks and um, they're paired off. So there's a um, there's a big pump that rotates the water in one direction through two tanks, and then in the opposite direction through the other two tanks. So rowers and they're fixed. Uh, they're sliding seats like a rowing machine, but the um, the oars are fixed onto the the sides of the uh, the tank so um, you can row uh, both sides in a sweep manner and then you can set it up uh, in the middle so you can row the way that the water circulates so you can actually scull so we set up um, sculling tanks and sometimes it's almost hard so you, you can get um, um, you know 32 rowers rowing all together and then there's like 25 ergs um, so they can others if there's an overflow that will will cycle them through and there are times when I've been coaching that I it's like juggling plates you know where you have uh, six plates that you're trying to keep up in the air I, I can't I can't circulate fast enough to make corrections for how people are are rowing in the in the tank or doing something on the uh, on the rowing machines incorrectly um, to be able to to manage everybody together. So I'll, I'll finish one and the other one's starting to degrade. So I have to run back to them. I said, no, uh, it's pretty, you know, but they're all enthusiastic about it and they want to learn, they want to get better. But it's interesting that some people are, you know, they they get into the sport and they're very natural. They're, mm -hmm. They just understand the the rhythmics behind it um and there are others that they just uh, can't quite 
as much as they want to, and they just never give up, but they just never quite get there. Um, there's just not that natural uh, intuition for um, how you come out of the finish, what happens first, um, and um, where are your shoulders, and you know how you you're at the catch, and, and what does uh, your elbow look like on your inside hand or your outside hand, and um, it's just a lot of information for people to um, uh, absorb, and um, unfortunately, you you know you can't give them a hundred percent of your time for two hours to be able to work on that. So um, you know that um, it's just a challenge sometimes for for coaching and for coaches. I am so sure that many coaches listening to you empathize with that situation we've all been there yeah yeah now just to wrap up patrick you have a special offer i believe for rowing chat listeners yeah we'd love to sell you gloves at a 10 percent discount we'll give you free shipping um just mentioned um uh rebecca's podcast and um and write us a note and we'll um work it from there um we don't have a uh, a uh, a checkout um, set up to automatically um, give this discount, um, so it will be um, a manual uh, operation. Um, you can place the order, and then we'll give you a, a partial refund to reflect the um, the discount. Um, let's do that for um, I don't know. Today's October seventh. Let's do that to uh, until November seventh. Brilliant. Thirty days. I better I better publish this ASAP. Okay. Yeah. Patrick, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you for sharing the design challenges, particularly for me. That was a real insight into a whole part of manufacturing, which I was um, not knowledgeable about at all. And I am definitely keen to hear more about your friends, the nanofibers. All uh, right. When they come to town. We'll have a we'll have a tutorial on nanofibers. Yeah. It'll be exciting. Well, let, <laughs> yeah, let's see. Let's see how they work out, and yeah. and and all your new fabrics. Yeah, I'll I'll keep you informed as to uh, you know the progress that we make. But um, thank you also. It was just a it was a real treat for for me to be able to uh, have a conversation with you about uh, our little company. Well, you've taken it from from zero to being the brand leader and changing people's not only people's minds, but also their actions. And for that, yeah. I definitely credit you and your hard work. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. So this has been Rowing Chat with Patrick Fricky from The Crew Stop. And if you're interested in rowing gloves, go take a look at his website, thecrewstop.com. And till next time. Goodbye. Bye.